Hey. Hello, hey everybody. Again. <laughs> I was noodling through the intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to be back. Hey, Dave. It's good to hey. see you. Good to see so, you, too. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in Buenos Aires right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you been there before? Yeah, it's my fourth time here. It's but uh, it's a fabulous city. It's a you know incredible city. Oh, great, great, good, good. You made it. Perfect. Yeah, that was that was the tricky part, <laughs> but I think they made it. <laughs> you, you're here. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the question and answer for last week's uh, uh, two topics that we uh, um, that tried to cover a little bit. You know, um, move into like a single string and the triplets. Um, I hope you, it was useful. You know. Uh, um, <laughs> my chaotic uh, uh, lecture style. So, um, do we have do we have any questions or do we got a lot of questions this time? Um, okay. So, and we're kind of kind of bounce back and forth between the triplets and the single string as it kind of they kind yes. of interweave a little bit too. Uh, abso absolutely, yes. Um, so, up at the top from uh, from Gary, I'm not even going to try the, the last name, but from Gary. Um, are there any exercises you can rec recommend to work on thumb index middle triplets going between two frets on the inside strings? Two frets? Yeah, going. Any exercises you can recommend to work on thumb index middle triplets going between two frets on the inside strings? I guess he's maybe talking about, let's say, if you're going on the second and fourth fret. That's what I would you know. understand from the question. Maybe that's not what you meant, Gary, but I'm, I hope I can answer uh, what I would understand now that you have triplets, which I talked about the triplet, that's, you know, when I, when I do the, the thumb and then middle and then index uh, on one string. And so if I go, that's good. You know, if I just do the triplets, Would be between two frets now or i can go and you know you can do that on any string yeah that's what i say and i mean that would be the exercise you know just moving through the scale maybe uh, and go Something like that, maybe. I don't know. Or you know, where you have maybe something like that. Um, but uh, I, uh, the, the question about exercise is is a good one. Uh, I personally like to come up with something a tune where i like it a technique like that for instance if i um what can i say if i have something like and if i would play that see that so i i just come up with this and so i would incorporate it into something that i already know and try to play something that I usually play melodic, try to maybe play it single string and then incorporate some of these triplets where I have time, you know. I, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I hope I did. Here's a question from Joseph Brosk um, about triplets. He says, curious about triplets, are they done only on one string? I find it easy to do them on the first string, not too hard on the third string, but difficult on the second string. And would you ever do a triplet on the first and second strings? For example, two strings on the first with one on the third. I quite don't understand that question. Too. I I'm think. Sorry. So, um, yeah, I think so. Is he's asking? So, so he finds it easy to do to do triplets on one string, but on on, on the first and second string, but difficult to do on the on the on the first and third string, but difficult to do on the second string. Yeah, so, so I know it's 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 difficult to get the to get the, the roll, you know, really get it inside, you know, get it on 
it's not easy really. I, it takes a little bit of practice and I I talked about this triplets uh, where, where I have these inside rolls. So uh, where it's a, a thumb on the second string, index middle on the first, and then index and thumb. different but I, I'm, not, I'm not again sorry I I don't quite understand the question um, yes I have to I have to pass you know more than of what I just explained you know and yeah the second part of the question is would you ever do a triplet on the first and second strings for example, two strikes on the first with one on the third. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, I see what he's saying. Yes. Yes, I, I, I sometimes would do that. Uh, yeah, that would be the other way. That would be the first and the second twice. The first twice. Yes, I would definitely use both of these at, at points. Yes, definitely. And can you bring Jens? Can you bring your camera down just a hair so we can see your right hand just a little bit more? Just a yeah. little bit. Yes. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Um, let's maybe see. Sit a little bit more like this so this helps maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question from, from Dan Mazer um, saying, how do you get such great tone on every fret of every string with every finger when playing single string? Hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always quite careful, you know, with the finger picks I'm using. If finger picks are not really, you know, um, if they're not played in well, or I start striking the string too much with the side, it starts to sound weak, you know, and uh, also the angle of the finger picks has something to do a little bit with the tone, of course, and I can uh, show you what I mean by that. When you look at my finger picks, they are not curved all the way around, but, you know, they're curved upwards. So on this side, maybe it looks a little less, you see, like this. And uh, when, when you look at the banjo, and you, when, I, when I play the string, and I would strike the string very, just straight like that, it sounds actually very thin. I mean, it doesn't sound thin, thin, but it sounds thinner than if I would press the string down. See, that's a lot, it's a fuller tone. So if there's a little, if there's a good angle on the on the finger picks, the tone becomes fuller, you know, a little a little fatter. And then uh, I use a, a a a blue chip thumb pick, which it it I just you know there's there's a few reasons I use this one right now because it's um, it sounds a lot like the finger pick itself. You see, there's not much difference in tone. Uh, that's what I'm. That's what I'm, I strive for. There's not too much difference between the thumb and this. You see, so it sounds fairly even. There's great finger picks that thumb picks that actually sound good by themselves. For instance, there's a new a material that Dunlop came up with. You know, I don't know five six years ago, uh, which is very hard and you know sort of translucent looking. It sounds very good by itself, but when I play th a single string, it just sounds a lot thinner than my index finger. <laughs> So um, that's one of the reasons I like these blue chip or, you know, the, 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 there's a, a, an alternative to this, which is the, uh, uh, the pro pick uh, uh, thumb pick, you know, which has great plastic, you know, that works really well. And it sounds very much like a, a finger pick. And there it depends again what kind of finger picks you're using, you know. I, these are, uh, right now I'm, I'm playing these Hofmeyer picks and they sound quite dark. So they work with this uh, uh, 
and so they work quite well. Um, so I, I take care of, you know, the because when you play here and then you have to play with the index down here, because of the hand, it seems like there's a different angle and you still have to make sure that you don't strike the string too much of the side, otherwise you get a, ra a rasping sound like that. Or here it starts to sound. But I don't never recommend to alter the hand the way the hand sits. It's like, you know, you're watching J.D. Crow and he plays like that. And for him, that was natural, you know. And I always like to say that when he went to sleep, he probably slept like that. Um, but um, for me, for a natural hand position is just the one where you just sort of drop your hand on the banjo. And that's how you have to bend your finger picks, you know, so they, start, so they still strike straight. So, I, bend, so I, I just put them on a little sideways so, so they work on all the strings and sound. As much as I can, you know, I mean, there's always a compromise, but that would maybe answer your question on that. Here's, here's another, uh, here's a couple questions about single string playing too. Here's one from George Donovan. He's saying, for single string, do you have preferred positions to work out of? For example, in the key of G, do you prefer working out of the F position between frets three and five or the D position between frets seven and nine mm -hmm. um, or the bar position around 12? Do you use all the positions? And another way to ask this might be, is it better for someone who is trying to master single string licks to focus on those positions and only go to the other ones when it suits one's needs? Yes, I think very handy comes in this D position here, you know, on G, because everything lays, lays so beautifully together. So, you know, I don't have the root right here somewhere. <laughs> I have to bring, I have to get it down here. But when you have like a lick, a backup lick of Scruggs, see, you're already working. That's already like a single string, but maybe. And then you start. You start doing to explore on this position because it comes in this position is a very handy one i mean they're all of course but this is a very handy one because i i, I when i play bluegrass i also play this d here you see and all i have to alter when i play the d here everything i learned up here and i'm in g you know and i'm using this d chord then i have to instead of using this note which you know for the position I use this, this which makes the D7. And I still use this 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 note which which would be a strange note to the to the G scale. This flat this flat five here. So but I but but it sounds great in context. So if I have a, a, a song like uh, my home's across the sorry my home's across the blue ridge mountain and that's that's just i go to d da, da, da. so i'm using this so I'm, I'm using this note even though it's not a g note but i'm using it in this in this what i explore and but you can use this the C here, the C here, and it's handy, you know, if you have like um, salty dark blues. But you have G D. See, now have G. I'm using the same, and then I'm on A. So here's A, and you know we're mainly using. Uh, this position with the flat with the flat and seven so not not this one this one here you know so i like this position a lot you know and it helped me to open up 
a lot of doors. And I use all three positions on that question. Um, because all these positions, you know, have different advantages. And, you know, and, and the bar position, again, you know, I, I, sh when I have a D here. I, I really use this middle finger here. It's, it's like open. You look at this. And instead of having this F sharp here on the low string, I usually get it in the bar position right back here, you know? I don't get it here, I get it back here. So when I'm here, in, let's say in D again, that, and I would have a capo, then I would have this, this note here. C sharp here, but I get it here. So this is a very handy position, and you see, as soon as you extend them a little bit, you're already getting into the next position. And so I'm already here in a D position, and then, and then already I'm in the D position. Down, next position, down again on this position. You see, uh, it goes very automatically. But I love this way if on the just basic question. This is probably the, the, the position that opened up a lot to me to move around. And of course, I would go uh, through through all these positions and these possibilities. You know, just singing along and just trying to come up with little things. Um. Let's see, here's a question from Ken Norkin. He says, you introduced and encouraged us to learn the three note rule for a scale pattern using three notes per string, but throughout the video, you employed other patterns. I have other teachers, teachers' exercises that vary the number of notes per string within a single exercise, sometimes based on a starting finger or fret. Do you believe there's a best way to play the major scales and their modes in single string? or should we be able to play them in many different ways and use whatever fingering works best in the context of an actual tune? Well, I would say the dratter, you know, is, is really true. You know, it's, it's all coming together at one point. So if you do an exercise, and we talk about exercise again, I won't, don't want to be too German about it. Um, I can say that because <laughs> I am or used to be. Um, and so if I, I can take two fingers, know and, and shift positions or just go with one finger or I think all of this is important but I, there is one major uh, trick actually not a trick but a a focus point you know in, in everything you do with single string I think that's very important and sometimes not mentioned is when you doesn't matter where you are, you should see in front of you on, on a string where the notes are that you can hit. You know, like when, when I'm here, I know that, I say I'm in D. I know I can play, this, uh, this is the next note, this is the next note, this is the next, this is the next, and this is the next. I don't have to think about that. I see it, you know. I know that when I'm in D, this string is not, belongs to the D scale. So does this, this this doesn't and this doesn't and this doesn't and this does not, and so uh, so that helps me to to move around because because I'm not just learning a pattern. You see, the problem is with with patterns that you, you try to remember a pattern. Okay, I have three. Okay, with two distance, then another three with two distance, and then I have to shift here, and you're starting to remember just the pattern instead of remembering where the notes are from a G scale. Let's say you are, uh, you are in the key of G, and I'd like to talk about the key of G because it's so natural to the banjo. So, um, and it's easy to say for anybody, and then go ahead and do it in all 12 keys, but, and then do it in minor. You know, that's just don't go so fast, you know, just real, really slow because, you know, it can be overwhelming, you know, if, if somebody just tells you that, do that, and then you, you don't see an end of it. 
but uh, let's just say you know you know all the D no the G notes on the banjo. Let's say you you're looking at the at the D string and you look at all the G scale note the G scale notes on the D string. Uh, same G notes on the G string of course and on the B string on the D string so uh, um, when you know all these notes you can see them and then for a D scale all you have to change is one note you know you, you're not um, you're not you're not having a C anymore you're having a, a, a C sharp and so here's the C, and now here's the C sharp. So all the all the notes that used to be the C, they are now not there anymore. Uh, they're gonna be they're gonna be C sharps. And then I don't have that fret. No one pecalny has got it, or other people, but I don't have it. But anyway, um, or Julia or Alison Brown has it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know all these notes, then already I know you know because you know all the G notes, then you know all the D notes, and then if you if you if you go to C, you know you just have to change uh, that F sharp to F, you know. So all these Fs, they all be, they, they they all become sorry, <laughs> they all become these F notes, and and you don't have to think about all the new arrangement because you know you know all the other notes. And that helps a great deal um, because then you 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 know you're in the key of G, so you know all these notes. And then if you play a different note, like a flattened seven, well, you know this is this F. Yes. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, uh, and so you know why that is? Because my other neck, my original neck, has actually the, <laughs> the inlay here instead of you. But... Um, uh, so then you only have to shift that uh, in your mind, you know, just one note, and then you go on and on, because once you know D, and then you go to A, all you have to do is, you know, uh, 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 change, uh, change that, uh, um, that G to a, to a G sharp, you know, and then you're in A. So you're always adding one note that you can change. So uh, that's, that, that's a good approach, you know, just to know, First in G, just know all the notes of the G scale. Just know them. Just, you know, look at the fingerboard and you know on the fourth string, is this a G note? No, it's not. This is one. Of course, it's not a G note, but is it a note from the G scale? And you go like, oh, no, this one is, this one, and this one is, and this one, this one, this one is, this one, this one. And if you know them, you know, just everywhere, uh, then it really helps you to develop and to understand a little better. And then, of course, you need to learn a little bit of, you know what the name of these notes are and then like i said don't go right into uh, you you got to know it in all 12 keys you know start with one key you know it's like diatonic accordions you know they have one key and they do a lot of music with it you know and then you go from there uh, because once you know one key you can easily more you more easily play in another key but if you start to work in all 12 keys and don't, don't know one really well, you overwhelm yourself, I think. Unless you are very, very smart. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> yes. Here's a question from uh, Rick Ryman. What finger exercises do you recommend for, for um, right-hand crossover patterns as when you have... For, as when you have to play strings one two three four or four three two one, um, et cetera, in sequence. Yes. Or and B awkward left hand stretch positions such as when you have to play an F seven arpeggio three four five seven treble to bass. Three. I don't know what what, what is it what is it. He was saying an F seven arpeggio. That. I think he meant. Or the. Uh, I think he was talking from the first string down, the third fret on the first string. Three. I see what he's doing. Yeah. This. He's going. He's. Three is the first string. Four is the second string. Five is the third. Seven is the. Uh, and then five, like this. 
like this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. I hardly ever use this chord because I would probably, if I need this A, if I need this A, I would probably play it here. I wouldn't probably, I never use this chord because, no, I mean, doesn't make much sense, you know, I mean, I for me, I, you know, if I would use it from be below here, I wouldn't use this F here. I would use this here on the second string. No. No, I wouldn't probably do that. But uh, exercises to, to um, you know, to, to go back and forth with the thumb index, you know, uh, crossing over like one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Can do that for a while and then do it on the second. Now just do that. I think that's a that's a maybe that's a good exercise. But like there again, you know, exercises is one thing. Um, and I, I've done my share of exercises here, but, but I can't really remember, you know, I just sort of... That was an Alamandi lick I, you know, struggled with for many years. For a, a, a Huckleberry Hornpipe. So he goes... And that was difficult for me because I couldn't do this really well. But after a while, this becomes just second nature. You know, if you 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 get the hang of it. You know, just yeah. I I think don't don't think too much. Just make them make them nice and even. I I think any exercise play them slow because at first play, I have a video that I made about playing fast. And uh, as soon as you can play something well enough, then then also put yourself in pressure of playing it as fast as you possibly can, because then the mind will sort out the problems not being fast enough, you know, by itself. You know, it will make the body find ways of doing it faster if you force to force yourself to play faster. But at first, you got to have the technique clean and right, you know. Um, so sit sit quietly and just. just And once you have that program, then you can speed it up. And I think that's very important. Yeah. On that same topic, kind of, if you were going down from, from the first string to the fourth string, would you stick with playing thumb index and go thumb on the first string, index on the second string, thumb on the third, index on the fourth? Or would you use your middle finger for that first string, for that first note, possibly? I'll get, if I go backwards like that? Yeah, if you're going from the first string down, playing one. Um, I would probably, I would, you know, I, if I do that, you know, usually, if I have to do that, my pattern is usually middle finger on the first, mm -hmm. and then thumb on the second, and then I cross over to the index thing and play the thumb here. Mm -hmm. That would be my, my go-to pattern. Play in the middle finger here and first, second string thumb, index third and thumb on the fourth. And same thing up or up again. Yeah, that's yeah. Bad. If you went up, you would finish with the with the middle finger. Yeah, I would finish with the middle finger. Yes. Yeah. Or like I said last time, if it's a triplet, I. Uh, you know, I would do this, and then move over here. But Huge. but in general, in general, you know, when I just play and I need to go, so 
I would I would do the same. It's the same pattern, backwards and forwards. Middle finger, thumb, index, thumb, or forward, thumb, index, thumb, middle. Okay. Yeah, I think right there is a very good exercise just to practice that that yes. kind of yes. pattern, that roll pattern. Yes. Yeah. And and you're saying if you were doing triplets, it would be a it would be like it would be a basically a forward roll. A forward, and then, yeah, a forward roll and, and just move I, and then move up with the thumb, you know. Yeah. Because it sounds very liquid. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, a lot of times if I have to do an entire chord progression like this very fast, I, I so, a lot of times also I do two things. You know, sometimes I do this. And then use the index finger here. Which goes upwards but not downwards. I wouldn't do that, you know. Hardly ever. Um, I, it happened. But this puts me, this puts usually the index finger onto the one, you know, of, of the beat. And that then I have to sort of turn around again sometimes. Um, what I do a lot of times to get an entire chord like that i just use the fifth string so i so i would start off to play an inside roll forward roll and then just move my ring finger up up to the fifth uh, up to the note here instead of here Music. so that makes it easier So I can so I can do this fast. That would be hard to do at that speed. So so I can uh, do things like that, man. Something like that, yeah. But uh, so I inside roll and move to the fifth string instead of the first and then I also have you know room for yeah so, so I can uh, let's say I have an E here another example be hard so but that's also it's almost melodic style yeah i hope that answered the question of of these problems yeah that's very good mm -hmm. um i see dan mazer in the comments just said he just got his money's worth so so i think it's <laughs> it's, it's well well it, it was it's free so it's okay <laughs> so, so it wasn't too bad <laughs> um yeah that that when you're up the neck doing those triplets it sounded like that um remind me of that known Kelney tune waveland do you know it where he's up the neck going uh he's done he's very do, quickly he, like yeah yeah right he's done he's doing things like that yeah 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 um, here's a question from Paul Fairbanks. Do you have suggestions on how to practice switching from standard eighth notes to triplets and back again? I'd like to be more fluid moving between the two rhythmic patterns. Thank you for all your wisdom, generosity, and knowledge. Oh, thank you. It's, I, I'm, I hope I'm of help always. Uh, really, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a tutor, you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to help a little bit. Um, yes, that's a good question. You know, if you go between uh, just a regular roll or just you know, if you, uh, regular eighth notes, and I would really do that. Um, bum, 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 and take a metronome. You know, metronome is a great tool uh, I use all the time um, um, uh, to to. A metronome is not basically that you're, you know, I have to play on the click or do things for productions, and it really helps me to. So what I would to set the, you know, you can set the metronome to the quarters. Bum, 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 bum. A 
Okay, so da 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 only with the thumb. And then you add the index. Okay. And then the triplets. So so you the the the, the thumb always stays on the quarters. with your thumb that the thumb always stays with the metronome and that can really help you you know to get into this triplet thing you can also go like uh, maybe maybe something like that you come up with uh, forward backward roll and then you do four triplets yeah something like that maybe you can you can come up with uh, variations of uh, what you could do yeah i think that's that would be uh, sufficient i don't hear you are you muted? I am muted. Good okay. catch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Here we go. Hi, Jens. Any questions to help us get fluent on the entire neck of the banjo, learning to connect all the positions? Well, yes. Uh, um, have Jens, can we have a little bit more of your right hand? That was older, I think. Yes, that's that's longer yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So actually, when you look at a position like like the F position here, and you look at the the, the the D the D position in G here, you know you don't have much in between. You basically have just this note in between here. You know maybe this one is already you know belonging to this position. Oh, you know also this one I play. I play all the notes. You know you know there's not really. But what I do is when I shift and I want to go down when I play. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's start this ago. Start this better. <laughs> I can. I have to think about it when you ask these questions in school. So, so I have this D position here, and I I know the D position. I know my way around. Something like that. Maybe I just just play, and now I want to go down. When I get to this note here, I use it, you know, with a, with a finger so I can go down, you know. And then I shift. And that's what I said before. Sometimes it's, you see, I'm using the same finger going, going down. And that's not, that's not a problem, actually. You know, it's not a problem do, doing this. That's why I said in the beginning, you need sometimes to have these little things. Or I'm going, I am at the next position. Or, or I'm here in this position, the F position, I'm starting to play. And now I want to go up instead of using this here, I use the index and then and here I am. I, I arrived at the new position. Same here, going up. I just try to open my hand out of the position and taking a finger that's, you know, a fingering that brings me closer back to that to that to that other position. And that that's why these scales. They are handy to play music, really. I mean, they are <laughs> the bass, you know. But but you would, you know, a lot of times the positions work a lot, work really, really well to come up with, with melodic ideas. But then to connect them, I, I use a lot of this, these 
this three note pattern. Yes, so that's how I connect basic, you know. Uh, sometimes it's uh, um, uh, a, a lot of times, you know, when you when you have an octave jump, if I have like, see, I I, I go to. It's nice to have an, just an octave jump into the next position. So doing doing a big jump in an octave always sounds really beautiful. You know, that that's also you don't have to connect everything that's just smooth. You can do a hard shift like see. Of course, I could play it here, but let's say I'm down here. So, you, so I'm just jumping up there, not not necessarily trying to connect it in any you know sophisticated way. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I connect them with 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 scales open up the position again you know i have a d and then to go down i just open up the position so i so i can move to the next position down you know or or mm -hmm. uh, a good exercise you know is of course you know a chromatic chromatic scale is also we have not talked about that which is a good exercise uh, if you i use the chromatic scale off and on, you know, uh, I mean, I use chromatics all the time, but chromatic, you know, just playing full chromatic scale. So if you, for instance, have here and I want to go chromatically down, what I do is I just uh, play four notes per string. And now I shift into the middle, just one fret lower. And then same thing, and then. So that would be my pattern for a chromatic scale. And then, so because it's everywhere the same, um, it's good just to have one. If I want to do a very long one, I shift in positions. That's why I came to this, uh, wanted to tell you this. For instance, I want to do a long chromatic run. I need, it's sometimes, I can do this, but when I want to do it more f really fast or smooth, I can do this. And instead of using this G here, I use the fifth string. And then I go here. And then the first string. So. Sounds quite smooth that way because I, I shift by using open strings. That Clean. Or yeah, like that. I, but that open strings sometimes also help you to shift positions. I just wanted to mention that when you hear, I have this note here, and then I, this is already this note here. So. So I shifted while using this string. Okay, all right. Yeah, Lucy Manning on the chat was saying your thumb looks really fluid and relaxed, which I guess helps with smooth shifts. So I think she's talking about your left hand thumb. Do you want to talk about maybe just the way you, the tension in your hand or how relaxed your left hand maybe is, especially in your thumb? Yes, that's it's basically you know when I when I when I play uh, when I play single string. My thumb tends to be sort of in the middle of the neck a little bit, you know, so I can open the hand more, you can see. If I'm in a closed position, bluegrass position, I even need the thumb to thumb, you know, and press down strings. 
But when I, when I start playing single string, I have a tendency of just being prepared for the bigger shifts, but for the bigger stretches, you know, because if, as long, if, if you have to open your hand this far up, you know, between index and, and pinky, um, the thumb just can't stick up, you know, the thumb has to come down, you know, when you look from the side. You know, if I go far, far apart, the thumb comes automatically down because I have to, you know, sort of. So, so when I'm when I'm in the back, when you look from the back, and uh, I would I would play. That's a close position, and and now I have to do a, let's say the G scale. You see, my thumb already goes down. So my thumb is actually holding more in the middle, so I have this full stretch. So I, 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 I notice sometimes when I, when I start single string, I, my, my thumb is very prepared just to move a little down, you know. I also make sure that my hand doesn't do this, you know, uh, too much. Let's do from the side, like this gooseneck. Um, that is not good for the tendons, you know, they have to go over, you know, and pull in a weird way. This is much better. So I always try to, uh, as much as I can, I see I have a little bit of angle, but I'm not trying to have it like this. Not a little bit. Of... See, it's more, it's not totally straight, but it's not, it's not, it's not like that, which makes it really weird looking. So I keep my arm a little bit like that. And you can see now where the microphone is in the way. You can see my arm is pretty, it's not like that. It's, it's more like that. And that makes it a lot easier for the fingers to move than having this going on. See like this, this, this would be really not beneficial. To the to the hand, you know, for for the movement, flexibility of the fingers. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. That's good stuff. Um, John Paul Humphrey is asking. You showed how pressing on the string gives better tone. Is there a way to do that with pizzicato? Hmm. I don't quite understand the question. Again, I'm sorry. Um, can maybe I think you can help me there? When you're you showed how Press it, pressing and getting a nice, clean, fluid tone when playing single string, because that the, um, you know, you're practicing that. But is there a way to get that that good tone? I think um, there's a rhythm to the right hand, and I can feel the rhythm better if I press down a little harder. You know, that's maybe that's maybe one thing I also want to say. You know, to this, and I don't quite understand the pizzicato part. You talk about pull-offs, maybe? That would be a left-hand pizzicato. Maybe if he's trying to play a very short, you know, a, you ah. know very da, 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 da. I do that sometimes, uh, where I, um, uh, where where I lift the fingers. You know that that's a great effect to just shorten the note for some smaller passages. You know, if you have yeah. you know, especially if I in the fast passages it's hard enough doable because it's too fast, you know. But uh, Just lift the finger off right away. Like that. Uh, I I like for practice for practice reasons. I like to press down the string, not 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 brutally because you can pull it out of, out of tune. But I like to have a nice grip on the string and a nice full solid tone. You know, when, when I really hold, I really, I, I, it looks like I'm not using any pressure, but my action is not the closest, and I'm using fairly thick strings. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the strings down quite enough. And when I play alone, it seems like um, I don't need to. But as soon as I'm with uh, uh, in a band situation on a stage and I need to be very articulate and very clean, it helps to have a, have a good grip on the string. You know, that's just better than just as having sort of a, I don't know, a, a, not really grabbing the string. Does that, I, maybe that makes yeah. sense, you know? It's, yeah, that's good. Um, we have... Because playing alone, you know, I'm sorry, sorry, Dave. Um, yeah. Because playing alone, you know, you tend to play very... You know, playing, playing. You know, uh, but to, to to develop tone is really to to get the banjo to a, to an optimum tone. You know, and then once you're with the band, you can, and then really the note comes. It's really a note is coming at you. You know, you're saying that note. And then when you do. Yeah. We have a question from uh, from DJ Buell saying, can you talk about pick noise again when playing triplets, especially on consecutive notes on the same string? Yes. Uh, 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 you're going to have pick noise because, because it's just the nature of the string. You have to stop the string. And because you're stopping the string, you get this little. And, uh, and you cannot really get rid of that. I said last time, if you take a little bit more from the side, just a slight bit, listen to this. It stops it quieter. You Can you hear that? Oh, wait a second. I go real flat. Now maybe you can, can't really hear. It also had something to do with the speed, you know, you play. When you play, you know, when you when you when you hit it quite fast, there's you can't hear that. You see, when I go slow, of course, there's a, there's a more sound. If I go real fast. So if I, um, I tried, you know, I used to try to make the movement fast, but then don't play faster, pick the same, and it's almost impossible. So, so I, uh, I just um, try to find finger picks, you know, that are played that are played in really well. That means they are nice and and rounded on top, nice and smooth. And uh, I've found. That softer finger picks, you know, softer finger pick material just makes less noise. And maybe that's, <laughs> it's, it depends on the shape of the finger pick, really. You know, um, uh, I think the pro picks are really good picks because they're, they're using quite a soft material. And once they're played in, they're actually fairly quiet. You know, they're, they're really good. They're really good finger picks. Um, old nationals, you know, I have lots of them and they sound really good, but they don't sound any better, you know, than some of the new ones made, you know, uh, but, um, yeah, I just try to find, when you move back and forth, you find places where there's more, like here. Less. And of course, the further you go to the bridge, the less vibration you have from the string because the string just doesn't vibrate out that much. So you don't have to actually stop it as much as 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 further here. Here, you, here you have a lot more pick noise than here because this is string because it doesn't vibrate much back. Here. You know, so when you when you have regular bluegrass banjo. You 
not you don't have that many p uh, pick sounds but when you play it here you see that there's a lot more going on here but again to your question you see there's a pick noise but I guess it's just part of the sound. Uh, also, uh, sometimes, you know, overtones and too many overtones arrive from a banjo if the head is slightly too loose. I mean, that sounds also a little weird, but if the head is really loose, you have a richer tone quality with more overtones. The banjo sounds more open and more free. And you have less of a mid-range that actually cuts through. So the difference between your pick noise and the note you create is going to be greater. You can, uh, when you have a low head tension, you can use a very thick string or a, a fairly heavy bridge, for instance, with a lighter string. And that will actually decrease some of the sound that will be transferred to the head. But then you lose some of the punch that you get by by having a, a little bit more of a head tension so um, head tension for me is always between a G and a G sharp you know, some, somewhere in there and uh, and if the head tension gets too loose I get a good nice warm sound at home but in the band you know or in recordings in quiet passages I start to get a lot of a lot more sound and noises you know that I'm, I'm not so keen about we're getting close to the top of the hour by one there's an, we have another question I want to get to. Um, this is from Scott Howell. This is part question, part comment. During the March 9th session, you indicated that those without sufficient sight would find traversing the neck impossible. Not the exact words, but you get the idea. I am blind and have been playing bass on and off for more than 20 years, and I just picked up the banjo. I would respectfully disagree that sight is necessary in navigating the neck. I'm sure is helpful and especially learning finger patterns are best ways to execute the various roles. Yes, I, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. What I meant by that statement was not that it's impossible. I, um, I, I, was, I was referring to that if you have to make a, a long jump, let's say from the, from the C chord and you have to go to the upper C chord, that's just more difficult, you know, for, for people. I've seen, you know, like, I played many shows with Doc Watson and I would see him, you know, take a D position and then he would go, you know, to, to you know, from the D, from the G, from, from the guitar, of course. And then he had to sort of find its way up, you know, by sort of sliding up and feeling its way, you know, to that. And it's just, you know, more difficult. I didn't say, uh, of course not, you know, uh, I didn't say that, that it's not possible. I didn't mean to, to say that. I'm sure, you know, you understand that I didn't mean to say that. Uh, because I've worked with a lot of people who don't have sight. That's why I even talked about the subject, you know. And for those who have eyesight, you know, for them it's easier sometimes, you know, because they can look before they go somewhere. They can look at the spot where they want to go. And that's a, that's a, just a great help, you know. But of course, it doesn't make it impossible for somebody who doesn't have that. With that all said, do you not see value you in learning to play while avoiding to look at the neck would would you not over time learn as i have to gauge distance more so by feel i used to play in a comfortable area of the neck on my bass however since picking it up again about two years ago yes. i not only started learning some music theory but i've challenged myself to expand my ability to maneuver around the neck by jumping from the lower frets to the upper frets yes i know and and I, that's that's very correct. I think after a while, you know, you don't need to look at the neck that much anymore because you just get to know it, but also requires, you know, some time. And I'm sure you played a lot, you know, to get to that point. So uh, I admire, you know, your, your efforts, you know, in doing that. So um, uh, and of course, you know, there's always ways to get around by listening to a slide, how it goes up and you can stop where you know it's going going to. Uh, or, you know, you use scales going up because you know how they're connected. But, you know, even for me, you know, after playing all these years, sometimes if I wouldn't look and I would have to go, yeah, maybe because I never uh, uh, played without really looking at the, without looking at the instrument. 
Um, of course, you know, that's, that's very individual, I think, you know. I actually, ha I worked with some uh, people who, are, who, who are, are blind and they made some marks in the back of the neck. You know, they made little, little grooves in the back of the neck so they can actually move around. A new electric guitarist, really, really good, and he played fantastic. And he had, with his pocket knife, he made a few little marks, you know, so his thumb could feel. And he knew exactly from the thumb, you know, where he would go or where, where, where a certain position was. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I hope I was uh, able to uh, answer some of some of your question. I'm very happy that you're watching, and I um, uh, I just uh, I just hope uh, it was not overwhelming or overbearing what I what I told you here. I hope I was able to help you a little bit. Uh, just keep in mind that anything you do in music, and uh, I have to tell that exactly to myself as well. It's, it's small steps, you know, if I have to learn something new, I have to take small steps uh, uh, to get there. And I will get there if I take, if I make the, sm if the, if I make the steps small enough, I think. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I can remember I got discouraged with things, you know, that I learned or needed to learn um, about modes and jazz and theory that I just wanted to learn it too quickly and I... I overwhelmed myself to totally, and uh, but with little steps of understanding, you know, every day or every second day, you, you learn a little bit of something, then all of a sudden it starts to connect the dots. It's like learning a language or uh, or anything really. Uh, it just takes takes a little while. And you have to be patient with yourself, you know. Um, that's that's pretty much all. But don't forget to play music. You know, this this technique is only there uh, to play music. Uh, it's like, yeah, uh, you learn language to say something, you know, uh, uh, you know, to be decent, I guess, you know, try to that, uh, you know, uh, try, try to say something that makes sense. Um, the same with music, you know, just to know things is not necessarily the music you wanted to play. And I want to say that every time, you know, you got to be really careful that the technique is not overpowering your imagination of music. Yeah. We do have a couple people asking about one thing and I thought maybe we could just maybe it'd be give us a chance to just play something out. They're asking about Irish reels and without getting into it, maybe really they just want to, maybe you could just play a, a well, quick you know, Irish no, no, reel. No. so forth you know so I, I always learn some Irish stuff before we go to Ireland on tour and or when we when we go up to Goderich and we get into a jam session um, and I always learn some 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 Irish tunes but why don't you go and buy yourself you know O'Neill's fiddle tunes and uh, uh, learn you know the wind that shakes the barley and you know uh, uh, Galway girl you know and all these all these reels or or some um, jigs and, and things if you like that kind of music you know you you just uh, buy the buy the sheet music and and you learn a few and they're fun you know i mean you i i learned quite a few over the years you know just to just to be able to jam on them you know i'm not an expert in irish music of course you know it's that that would that would be far-fetched but i you know um uh, but they're fun well thanks Ian. this was this is great um i I know I, I I picked stuff up from from the session as we as all of them I always do. So uh, um, we have next week we're taking off, but then we have uh, our our next session week five. You know, um, March thirtieth. Yes, right. Well, I'm looking forward to see you then again. You all take care, uh, stay well, leave a comment, you know, and uh, uh, and good luck with your with your playing. Take care. Bye-bye.